they to the speaker, uh, Patrick Caloy. Patrick is uh, a neighbor and a friend. He is a CREA research professor and has a, his group at the IRB in Barcelona, across the street. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I met Patrick uh, many years ago. Uh, I was uh, has the opportunity to be in his PhD committee, if I remember correctly. Uh, Patrick make a, 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 an important uh, contribution uh, to the field of uh, networks, biological networks in the early times of protein-protein interaction networks in the analysis of some of the first data uh, that were generated at the NBL Heidelberg when he was a staff scientist in, 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 a, uh, in Heidelberg. He is still uh, an obvious name in this area of, of protein networks and interaction networks. But in the last years, he has been moving to uh, a more, uh, I would say, uh, even challenging uh, world connecting uh, proteins and other data types with, uh, with uh, chemical data, with, uh, with drugs and, uh, and molecules and uh, uh, interpreting all that in the, con in the context of all diseases. Uh, on which he has produced a number of uh, not only interesting uh, research, but also a number of uh, um, tools that are uh, entering in this field of connecting different uh, molecular types. So I guess we are going to hear more in detail about all that to today. So we really uh, look forward and we thank uh, Patrick for uh, making the time to be with us today. Please, Patrick. Yep. Thank you very much, Alfonso, for the introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here physically. So David showed me the building uh, two weeks ago, but it's uh, beautiful, so I will enjoy uh, visiting again. So uh, yeah, today's talk is going to be... Oops, hold on. Okay. It's going to be a little bit about overcoming a long-lasting uh, personal uh, frustration, right? So. Uh, I'm pretty old, so uh, as Alfonso said, not as old as him because he was the president of my PhD thesis uh, tribunal, but quite old. And uh, these are my childhood friends, basically. So you can see that this guy in here, he's in charge of Amazon research here in Barcelona. Uh, Alberto is in charge of uh, the IBM research in Southern Europe. Uh, Rodri has a company that mines all the, the data that goes around Twitter and things like that. And Albert works in a company that has 100 satellites all over the globe. And he analyzes the images that they take on the fly. So these guys were there at the very beginning of uh, artificial intelligence or, or uh, neural networks, let's say. And so was I, but I was the poor biochemist. So I wanted to play with them and they didn't allow me to do it. And this is just to show you how old I am. This is my first ever paper. And as you can see, it is a neural network, right? That we published in Cabios. This was the seat for Bioinformatics Journal now. And I implemented this uh, predictor of uh, transmembrane helices using C. But then when we submitted it to Cabios, one of the reviewers said, there's no way on earth a biologist will ever use a program that is implemented in C and has to compile it. So if you want it to be published, you have to transform it into Excel. So this is what we did, right? So I implemented a, a neural network in Excel files. So check that. But the thing here is that for many years, I wanted to play with my friends saying, hey, can we please use the algorithm that you're using? And their answer was always the same. So you don't have enough data. You think you have enough data, but you don't. So don't try. Okay, so now the situation has changed. We do have a lot of data. And in fact, we have more data than they have in some of the fields and we are expecting even more data. So the problem now is not an artificial intelligence, as you know, is not already the future. So this is the reality in chemistry, biochemistry and drug discovery. So the best planners for retrosynthesis are neural networks. And we have drugs that have been at least partially designed by artificial intelligence that already entered clinical trials, etc. So this is already the reality. So the problem now is not that we don't have enough data, is how we format this data. Because if you're dealing with images, if you're dealing with free checks, et cetera, so the format is not a problem. It's always the same. 
But here we're dealing with, <clears throat> as you know, lots of different experiments, each one with a different format that we need somehow to standardize. So I'm coming from bioinformatics. So this is cool, is what we call heaven because biomolecules are kind of self-formatted molecules. So we have building blocks. If we're talking about nucleic acids, this is for uh, different nucleotides. If we're talking about proteins, it's 20 amino acids. We have a domain architecture usually. We have a clear sequence to structure to function relationship. And all these molecules have been optimized by millions of years of evolution. And of course, we only have a very finite set of roughly 20,000 genes or 10, uh, 100,000 uh, proteins that are very well organized in beautiful databases. When we move to the small molecules, to the chemistry, this is completely different. So these guys in here are monolithic entities. You cannot split them into functional domains. There's no clear ar architecture or structure to function. And if anything, they have been very mildly optimized by people. We have more than 200 million commercial molecules that you can buy straight away, and they are very poorly organized, at least in the public domain, right? So pharma companies is a slightly different. So what, and the other thing is that, of course, visually, you might not know that these are an APOL2, but it's pretty clear that you have a template here, you have a machine, and there's something that is being copied here. When you look at small molecule, you either know what this does exactly, or you cannot guess its function. So what people, <clears throat> sorry, what chemoinformaticists have been doing for the last 30 years is try to somehow encode the chemical structure of these compounds in the form of a vector so that we can compare them in different uh, types. So using structural keys, Morgan fingerprint, the scaffolds, etc. Because what kind of uh, drives chemoinformatics is what we call the similarity principle. So we know that two molecules that share the chemical structure tend to bind to the same receptors and tend to do the same function. Not always, but uh, depending on the similarity, this is pretty common. So in the last 15 years, and thanks to all these omics experiments that we're all producing, we have seen that the similarity principle not only applies to similar structures, but molecules that trigger similar transcriptional effects also tend to have similar bioactivities or the molecules that trigger similar side effect profiles at the higher level, at the human level, also tend to have similar bioactivities. Or those molecules that kill the same type of cancer cell lines tend to have similar bioactivities. So what we set off to do almost 10 years ago with Miguel Duran in my group was trying to encode, to format the information related to these small molecules, but not to encode their chemical structure, but to encode their bioactivity. So what is the action that these molecules will do when exposed to a biological system? So to cut a long story short, we came up with a structure that we call the chemical checker for obvious reasons. You can see that this is a checker that contains experimental information for about 1 million bioactive molecules, right? And we have divided this information in five layers of complexity following a little bit the way we have to understand drug action. So at the first level, we have the chemistry, of course. So this is descriptors of the, these compounds using their uh, chemical structure. But then of course, for a compound to be active, they have to bind to a biomolecule, to a target. This is the second level of complexity. Then when you modulate the function of one of these targets, this modulation gets spread out in the cell through different types of networks, pathways, biological processes, et cetera. And we can measure these effects in cell-based assays using gene expression, cancer cell line, chemical genetics, uh, what the morphology, what people call uh, high content screens, et cetera. And finally, for the few compounds that reach the clinics, we also have information about the therapeutic areas, interaction, side effects, et cetera, right? So once we had all this information about 1 million uh, bioactive molecules, what we try to do is to somehow encode, to codify, to format this information in a standard way that we can use then in machine learning, et cetera. Then of course, big numbers are powerful, but are very difficult to interpret, right? This is just a couple of examples that you pre know pretty well, I'm sure. Transcriptomics, for instance. So most of this data comes from the Lynx repository in the Broad Institute. So these guys have tested something like 20,000 small molecules. So they put them into between three and 77 different cell types, and then they measure the gene expression changes that these small molecules uh, trigger. 
So this is very nice, but of course, if we're interested in drug action and annotating the bioactivity of these drugs, we have to separate, we have to disentangle what is the genetic background of the cell from the real effect of the drugs or a drug response, for instance. This is just comparing two different experiments, one done in the broad, the other done in the Sanger. It looks like there's no correlation between the bioactivities measured in the two institutes, apart from one only drug. But then when you treat these numbers uh, properly, you can see that, in fact, the correlation is pretty good. Right? So there's a lot of kitchen in here. There's a lot of uh, massaging of the data that is important. And as you know, the devil is always in the details. So I'm going to skip this, but this slide basically represents three years of work. And this is basically how we had to massage all this data in order to get fingerprints that are represented for the bioactivity in the 25 different spaces that we have defined in the chemical checker. And again, I'm more interested in the applications here in showing you the applications, all the technical details. I'll be happy to answer questions or the paper was published a couple of years ago already. But at the end of the day now, what we have is a means of defining small molecules, chemical compounds based not only on their chemistry, but also based on their bioactivities at the target level, at the networks level, at the cell-based assays level, and at the clinical level. Right? So at the end, what we have is this is 25 different descriptors attached to each small molecule that tell us about the effects that these small molecules are likely to do when exposed into a biological system. And this is just to show you that uh, these different descriptors are not redundant. They are, in fact, pretty complementary. Right? So you can see here, for instance, these are drugs that are approved for ophthalmology. You can see that at the chemical level, there's no structure, so each drug is completely different. So these are the descriptors that we're building, 128 dimensions. But when we go at the mechanism of action level, for instance, we can see that there is a very clear structure in here. All these drugs look to be doing the same or these ones in here. And we go to the networks level and we also see the same sort of structure. Right. So there are some properties of these compounds that we can capture in some bioactivity levels and that we do not see when we only look at the chemistry. So this is a nice idea, but does it make sense? Of course, we have to sort of benchmark it. So the best that we could come up with here is to say, OK, so do molecules that have similar descriptors in each one of the spaces tend to have similar activities? And in this case, the activities that we're looking at is mechanism of action for drugs and therapeutic areas. right? And then you can see how molecules that are close in each one of these spaces are able to recapitulate molecules that have similar mechanism of action or therapeutic areas. In some cases, very good, with very nice areas under the curve. In some other cases, very modest, but always above 0.5. So it seems that it makes sense. This is just another way of looking at that, right? So we can cluster each one of these bioactivity spaces and then ask, OK, so are these clusters enriched for a particular molecular uh, uh, mechanism of action or therapeutic area? And again, in the majority of the cases, the answer is yes, right? So things that we are clustering together in the different spaces tend to have different uh, similar mechanism of action or therapeutic areas. And then, of course, these descriptors, we can use them to characterize different compound collections. And this is something that we are doing at the IRB together with the drug screening facility. Right. So these are just 2D representations of these uh, multi, uh, multi-dimensional spaces. So what you see here in the background is all so the, the layout of all the bioactive compounds. And then we are here overlaying approved drugs, for instance, or linked compounds. You can see that when we look at the physical chemistry, these two collections look pretty different. Or if we look at mechanism of action, for instance, we can see that the experimental drugs are luckily exploring some areas of this mechanism of action that we have no approved drug that is currently exploring. So this is just sort of analysis. And of course, we can take this a little bit further and start sort of guessing more than predicting guessing functions. For instance, what you see here <clears throat> sorry, is four different compounds completely different from a, a chemical perspective. You can see that three of them are well annotated compounds. These are anti-cancer drugs that are DNA calens, as I said, completely different from a structural perspective. But we see that all of them kill the same sort of cancer cells. 
and all of them elicit similar transcriptional responses, right? So you can use this information to guess that this molecule here maybe will have a similar function than these other three here, even though their chemical structure is very different. Or something that is very trendy now, new antibiotics, right? So we have two different families of antibiotics here, one family that only changes in this radical here, the other in this here. So of course, all the members of this family are very similar from a chemical perspective. All the members of this family are very similar. They have very similar mechanism of action. So they kill the same type of bugs. But when we expose these members, the members of these families into eukaryotic cells, the transcriptional responses that they elicit are completely different, right? So we might guess that members of this family and members of this family will probably show a different spectra of side effects in humans. So this is characterization. Now I'm going to show you what we can do or a few of the exercises that we have done with these bioactivity descriptors for small molecules, right? Because the aim here is to be able to link chemistry and biology. So to look for small molecules that do something related to biology that we are interested in. So this is the first example. So as you can imagine, most of the data that populated the chemical checker has been extracted from cancer cell lines, right? So we wanted to see whether this information can be kind of uh, extrapolated to different cell lines that the checker has not ever seen, right? So what we did here in the lab is to use these SHSY5Y cells, let's call it neuron-like cells, right? So this is information that we do not have in the chemical checker we introduce some uh, mutations that are representative for familiar Alzheimer's disease. And then we run some differential gene expression uh, experiment between let's say the healthy neuron-like cells and the Alzheimer neuron-like cells, right? And then what we did is we transformed this into our descriptors and say, okay, is there any compound in the chemical checker that can revert these signatures? In other words, that can transform the signature of expression of the Alzheimer cells to the signature of expression of the healthy cells. Well, this is just to show you that these neurons are doing what they are supposed to be doing, like uh, increasing the AB42, AB40 ratio, et cetera. And again, to cut a long story short, we found a few compounds. Some of them are known drugs. Some of them are uncharacterized uh, compounds that were indeed able to revert these Alzheimer signatures. So what you see here, is the number of up and down regulated genes that we can change, that we can flip their expression in the top 500. So not all of them, of course, but we can flip roughly 20% of the genes that are characteristic for Alzheimer's disease. And these are not random genes, right? So these are the ones, as I'm saying, that are really important for Alzheimer's disease, like this one here, BIN1, this is involved in, in vesicle endocytosis and the synaptic membranes. We have some glutamate receptors as well in the uh, synaptic membranes, et cetera, right? So with these compounds, we are able to push up the genes that are down-regulated in Alzheimer compared to wild type and to bring down the ones that are up-regulated in Alzheimer compared to the wild type. So this is in cells. How about in vivo? So what we did here is we took three different models for Alzheimer's disease, mice models, and then we run some full proteomics and transcriptomics experiments of the hippocampi of these animals at different stages of the disease. Of course, we always used wild type, so healthy aging and Alzheimer's disease in the onset, progression and advanced disease. Then we played a little bit of standard bioinformatics and what we could identify is different modules that remain stable in healthy aging, right? Three months, six months, eight months, no changes, but that were increasing in the sick animals. And this was both at transcriptional level and also at the protein level, right? Same module remains stable in healthy aging and it goes up as Alzheimer's disease progresses. Then the question here was exactly the same. So can we find any compound in the chemical checker that is able to revert the expression of this module? But then, of course, these are animals, these are not cells, which means that we cannot go to the million compounds in the checker. We have to restrict ourselves to approved drugs. And as you can imagine, otherwise I wouldn't be telling this story, the answer is yes. So we could identify something like 800 uh, compounds 
that had the potential, at least according to the chemical checker, to revert these Alzheimer's signatures. But we could see, of course, we couldn't test 800 compounds, but we saw that there were two very well-defined groups of molecules here, right? On the one hand, there was the enzymes, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and then on the other, we had antihypertensive, right? So these are drugs that are safe, that are in the market, that people use in a chronic matter. So what we did is we set off the experiment. So with wild-type mice, with Alzheimer mice, we grew them for five months, and then we treated them for a month. And then we ran some behavior tests. So I'm sure you, most of you are computational people, so you're not familiar with this. But the test that we run is something that is called novel object recognition. Right? So the idea here is that you have a case with one object and a mice or a mouse. And then this mouse gets familiar with the object. And then after uh, a week, you introduce another object. And then the normal mice, the healthy mice, spend more time exploring the new object because he remembers the old one, while the Alzheimer, Alzheimer mouse doesn't remember that he has already seen this one, spends about the same time exploring both objects. And this is exactly what we see here. So in healthy mice, they spend something like 60% of the time exploring the novel object, while <clears throat> the Alzheimer mice spend 50% on each object. And then what you can see already is that for four out of the six drugs that we tested, we can recover the normal behavior at the phenotypic level, right? At the behavior level. But how about molecularly? So what we see here is that indeed, these four drugs, that improve the cognition in mice, all of them were able to bring down the genes that are overexpressed in uh, Alzheimer hippocampi, right? But only one of them, pembutolol, that is the one that gave the best results in here as well, were also able to lift the genes that are underexpressed in mice, uh, Alzheimer mice hippocampi. And then again, these are approved drugs. And then what we did is to check cross-check these with human data. And what we see is that indeed at epidemiological level, so population studies, for people that are taking in a chronic manner, antihypertensive are less prone to develop Alzheimer's disease. And this could be indeed uh, one explanation. And of course, I forgot to say that none of these drugs has ever been linked to Alzheimer's disease uh, before, right? So this is completely new. So it seems that this, using these uh, molecular uh, bioactivity signatures to find compounds able to revert transcriptional uh, uh, signatures work both in vitro and in vivo. Other exercises very weak that we used. So mimic the activity of biotrucks. So you know that biotrucks now are very trendy, uh, monoclonal antibodies, very powerful, but of course they're very expensive to obtain and they are difficult to handle. So if we can find small molecules that do the same thing than biodrugs, this is going to be a, a big asset for pharma companies. <clears throat> so in this case, we tried different examples. I'm just going to show one. So we tried to mimic the effect of the clizumab. This is an antibody that is approved to uh, avoid a rejection upon organ transplantation, right? And then this one uh, acts by binding to the interleukin-2 uh, receptor. And basically the experiment that we run here was saying, okay, so now we kill genetically the interleukin-2, and then we run some transcriptional signatures between the cells, in this case was PBMC, peripheral uh, monoclonal cells, like the original experiment, wild type cells, and the ones where we genetically killed this uh, interleukin-2. And we look for compounds, in this case, not able to revert this effect, but to mimic it. So to do the same effect than killing the receptor. But here, we didn't only look at the transcriptional level because we want to mimic the effect globally. We don't care about touching this receptor. So we also include three network levels, right? So we don't care if we touch uh, this uh, interleukin to directly, but we want to achieve the same effects globally. Again, to cut a long story short, we identified 19 different compounds and 14 of them, 14 out of the 19, were able to very specifically inhibit the growth depending on interleukin-2. You can see it here, even much better than the clizumab itself. Right? So this is just one example of the experiments that we run. So you have here cells, PBMCs, without interleukin, and then you can see that they don't grow. Right? When 
we add interleukin, these cells start proliferating. And of course, with the clizumab, we stop the growth. And with one of our compounds, this compound 20, we are also able to stop the growth even more than the clizumab in a very nice dose-dependent manner. This is expected. Then, what else? So we know that downstream of interleukin-2 receptor is STAT5 that gets phosphorylated if we inhibit the interleukin-2 receptor as uh, the clizumab is doing. What we see is that interleukin-2 without the clizumab, there is phosphorylation of STAT5. We include the clizumab and there is no phosphorylation anymore. But the phosphorylation is unaffected using our compound 20. So what this means is that we are achieving the same effect so inhibiting growth, cellular growth, depending on IL-2, but using a completely different mechanism of action that we don't know what it is. We're exploring it. And this is just to show you that uh, this is not a nuclear bomb so that the growth that we are inhibiting is the one that depends on interleukin-2. It's not that we're killing all the cells in the world. Just a couple more examples using different, uh, different antibodies, stachizumab, that is used against psoriasis or cetuximab against uh, uh, colon cancer, different experiments, but always the same results. So we are able to find using the, the chemical checker uh, bioactivity signatures, compounds that are able to mimic or revert the effects of uh, bio drugs. And this is just the web of the chemical checker. So of course, uh, give it a try. It should work. It almost always does, and you can download all these biological or bioactivity descriptors for small molecules. So I told you that the, the chemical checker contains experimental information for one million compounds. This is, of course, true, but is also is half true, let's say. So, of course, we have information for one million compounds always at the chemistry level, but as we progress in complexity, the experimental information is for fewer and fewer compounds, right? So we have information about the targets for about half a million of these compounds. We have network information for 300K. We have cell-based experiment for 30K. And unfortunately, when we reach the clinics, we only have experimental information for about 5,000 compounds. <clears throat> So what Martino Bertoni and my group set out to do is to try to complete the bioactivities for all these uh, different spaces. And this gets a little bit techy now, but basically uh, we saw that none of the distance uh, matrices that we were using were good enough. So Martino decided to use what is known as a Siamese network, right? So to invent our own metric. So basically how this works is saying, okay, <clears throat> So we have experimental information for compound A at the chemistry level and at the target level, we have information about the compound B at the chemistry level, networks level and clinic level. Are these two guys going to be similar at the cell level? So he implemented these uh, Siamese networks and what we could do is to complete the information contained in the chemical checker. So for all the compounds where we only had partial information, we now have 1 million signatures for each one of the, or 25 bioactivity signatures for each one of the million compounds in the chemical checker. So of course, in some cases it works really well. So areas under the curve close to one. In some other cases, it doesn't work that well, but we're always around 0.7. And what is important here is that we implemented an applicability domain score so that we know which ones of the signatures that we are inferring can be trusted in which ones cannot be trusted. And then of course, with 1 million compounds with, uh, with uh, complete information on the 25 bioactivity signatures, the next step is to implement deep, ne deep networks in this case, to go directly from the compounds to the bioactivity signatures. So in a, in a, a methodology that we call the signaturizers so that you can come up with any compound that you dream of, and then using these deep networks, we can produce these 25 different bioactivity descriptors for these compounds. This is very powerful because now we are not restricted to only the bioactive compounds that we have annotated. We can go and play with any compound collection of interest. And this is just a couple of illustrative examples. So what you see here <coughs> is uncharacterized compound collections 
Ripple hub, so these are drugs, human metabolites, bacterial metabolites, these are plant extracts, and these are food extracts, right? So we have derived these bioactivity signatures for all the compounds in these different collections. And then what you can see is that all of them map into a slightly different area of this bioactivity space. Then of course, we can zoom in into any of these collections. And then we can see, for instance, if we focus on the approved drugs, we can see that, for instance, those drugs that are being used for cardiology and the ones that are being used for oncology map into very different areas uh, in these different plots, right? And the same happens with uh, the metabolite that come from different bacteria or the, the extract that come from different plant families. So is this something that we could do with the chemistry alone? So the answer is that most of the times not. This is not that you can do only using chemical information. You need the bioactivity descriptors. This is just one example, right? So we are mapping here different drug compounds for which we know their mechanism of action. So if you classify these different compounds according only to the chemistry, very rudimentary chemistry, this is true, Morgan fingerprints, you can see that there's no structure in the mechanism of action. While if you use these bioactivity signatures for the different compounds, you can see that there is a very nice clusters where all the compounds that have similar mechanism of action tend to cluster together. Is this general? Well, the trend is yes. So what you can see here is that we have tested different collections for clustering known targets, mechanism of action, indications, disease, et cetera. And whenever you see blue here, it means that the bioactivity signatures tend to produce more coherent clusters than the chemical signatures. Whenever you see red, it means that the chemistry works better. So you can see that there are cases where chemistry works better than our descriptors, but in the vast majority of the cases, it's our descriptors that bring some extra information that is useful. And then of course, so kind of linking these back to my first slide. So these descriptors, what you can do is to plug them in readily into machine learning uh, implementations. Right? So whatever your favorite AutoML uh, code that you use. So this is just one very standard benchmark, molecular net, that has different or benchmarks of different uh, complexity from very high physiological conditions like clinical uh, toxicology <clears throat> to or the penetration of the blood brain barrier to something much easier in biophysics like binding to the HAB uh, protease or inhibition of the beta secretase, et cetera. So again, to cut a long story short, what you can see is that when we implement, when we fit this uh, uh, standard, in this case was a random forest and exposed uh, machine learning algorithms with bioactivity descriptors, the performance is almost always better than when we only use chemical information. Not always again, but the closer, the more complex the task is, so the closer to physiology, the more advantage our bioactivity descriptors have over chemistry. When we go to simpler tasks, like uh, uh, binding to beta secretase or the HIV protease, we're performing roughly at the same level than the chemistry alone. So this is for chemistry and annotating from a bioactivity perspective, uh, small molecules, chemical compounds, but how about biology, right? So as I said, I'm pretty old. So in fact, the first draft of the human genomes came up the same year that I was defending my PhD. This was in year 2000. And then during my postdoc, we saw the first genomes, transcriptomes, proteomes, interactomes, and we were very excited, right? But this was just a handful of uh, papers and data sets. But now came time and space and environmental conditions and extra levels of regulation. And now this is impossible, as you well know. So we have more than 200 petabytes of data organized in almost 2000 different databases, the only ones the only stored at the European Bioinformatics Institute. So if we want to merge now chemistry with biology, we also need to process the biology here, not only the chemistry. So as you know, there are many algorithms, many papers that tend to do that, but in our experience, what most of them do is just using methods that have been developed for one type of information and applying it to all the rest. And then they 
extract all the information from one type of information and they use the rest as a support. What we try to do here, and this is the PhD thesis of Adria uh, Fernandez in my group, is try to merge and format as much as we can of this biological knowledge. So what Adria did here is to establish what we call the biotech. So this is a huge data uh, knowledge graph here that of course this is biology, so it's gene centric, right? So this biotech contains information about 12 different entities, genes, cells, tissues, disease, and we have almost 70 different types of associations. So there's a gene that is upregulated in a cell, or there's a gene that is mutated in a given disease, or there is a compound that is used to treat a disease or that inhibits or interacts with the gene, right? And overall, we have more than half a million nodes and more than 30 million ages. So this is a lot of data to process. So what Adria used here is uh, what is known as embeddings, right? We try to encapsulate all this information in the form of embeddings so that we can produce, again, descriptors, in this case, not for small molecules, but for the different biological entities that tell us about the context. So how do we do that? So we establish some random walkers that go through this huge knowledge graph, and we had to establish the different metapath the, the ways that we let the random walker to walk. So in this case, we wanted to explore a particular vicinity, like a compound that is related to a pathway that participates in a disease that is associated to a gene and then goes back to a disease, right? So we set up this random walker and at the end, all these random walks, we treated them like if it was the corpus of information, like for natural language uh, processing. And then we use this very well-established algorithm that is called word to back to embed all this information. So at the end of the day, what we have is for each one of these biological entities present in here, we have a vector that describes their function according to the environment, according to the context that we have defined in here. So overall, what we have now is more than 1000 different embeddings for uh, each node in the biotech, right? So we have different ways of capturing the biological context of each one of these nodes, depending on the process that we are interested in. I'm not gonna go into details, but uh, this is, I mean, we're about to submit this to a uh, bioarchive. It's gonna be today or tomorrow, but I'm gonna tell you about the future. So what, what are we planning to do now? And our idea is to move towards personalized systems pharmacology. So now, what we have is the bioactivity descriptors for small molecules, and now we have biological descriptors at different levels of complexity of biological processes. So what we try to do is to blend here to match, as I said at the beginning, biology and chemistry to find molecules that are able to modulate the biology at different levels, at the target level, but also at the disease level or cellular level, right? Trying to find guys in here that match or that revert these biological signatures. This is something that is on its way, but then of course, this is nice drug repurposing, et cetera. But I told you at the beginning that we only have something like 5,000 approved drugs and we have about 1 million compounds, bioactive compounds in the chemical table. But of course the synthetically accessible molecules space is huge, I mean 200 billion, right? So if we only play with these bioactive compounds and we forget about the rest, it's literally like comparing the water that comes out of my, my top house with the Niagara Falls. This is the level of, of magnitude in the comparison. So again, thanks to machine learning and in this case, uh, artificial intelligence, what we're trying to do here is to move to generative models so that we can design new molecules with the properties that we want, profiting from our biological and the bioactivity descriptors. I'm sure you have seen these type of applications, right? So you can go, so you, you can train generative models on millions of faces, and then you go and say, okay, now produce a face that looks European, middle-aged, that is a female, and that is happy. And it comes up with this face that looks like a real person, but it is not, right? So this is an image that has been composed by the generative model. We can do this and, and I'm sure most of you will not be able to tell the real faces from the ones that have been generated. So this is exactly what we're trying to do with the small molecules, right? Because now 
thanks to the biotech and thanks to the chemical checker bioactivity signatures, we can train these generative models, not only with the chemical structure of the compounds, but also with their bioactivities at the different levels. And then we can ask these generative models to generate new chemical entities that fulfill the bioactivities that we want. This is just one example that is going on in the lab. So in this case, we're trying to design new chemical entities that very specifically target two different proteins that there's no compound in the market that we know of that are able to target. So the blue points, again, I'm not gonna go into details, but the blue points are our starting compounds here and the green ones are the ones that we are generating. These are compounds that do not exist, but you can see that at least according to our bioactivity descriptors, they're very, very close to our target, right? And we are in the process of synthesizing two of them and then see whether they're really able to bind to the two different targets that we have designed them for. So basically, uh, the, the whole story that I told you about the, the, the chemical checker bioactivity signatures, etc., it reminds me very much of this uh, parable of the Indian blind man and the elephant, right? I don't know whether you know it or not, but basically the story here is that there's uh, six, uh, five or six blind men, Indian blind men that walk into the jungle and then they bump into an elephant, right? So they are blind, so they can only use their hands. And this one here say, look, I found a rope. And he said, no, what do you mean a rope? It's a wall, we cannot pass here. Say, no, it's not, a, it's not a wall. It's a tree because I can hold a trunk or be careful because there's a, a spear or a snake here. And then the idea is that, of course, all of them, what they do have is partial information on the element, right? So our idea here is that for small molecules, if we really want to find out what they are able to do, we cannot stop at partial information and having not only the chemical descriptors, but these bioactivity descriptors will give a more complete picture of the potential of each small molecules. So overall, what I presented during this talk is this chemical checker that is a repository for small molecules with experimental information on their bioactivity, about 1 million molecules. We have developed these bioactivity fingerprints that are able to extend the similarity principle to all levels of biology and presented a few examples on Alzheimer's disease or mimicking the effect of biotrucks on how we can use them. Then the next step was building this signaturizer so that we can now infer chemical check signatures for any molecule of interest. And then finally, we have created this biotech that is the resource that collects and harmonizes in a qualitative form, of course, most known biology in a knowledge graph, and we have derived these biological signatures, right? So that can tell us about each one of these biological ent entities in different contexts. And of course, what we're doing now is trying to blend the small molecule descriptors with the biology descriptors to come up with new chemical entities that are able to do what we want them to do. And as you can imagine, I did very little of this work apart from writing it up and presenting it. And the vast majority of what I showed is the work of uh, Miguel Duran, former student and then postdoc uh, in the group. Now he has created his own uh, NGO. Together with uh, Victor and Edu and Sergi that did the wet lab uh, experiments. So the signaturizers is work of uh, mainly Martino, again, with the help of uh, Miguel, Martino is still a, a group uh, in the group. He's a staff scientist in the group. And finally, the work on the biotech, et cetera, is the work of Adria Fernandez, that is a PhD student, four-year PhD student in the group that is about to uh, finish as well with the help of Nuria and Isabel that are the two technicians at the Experimental Biology Lab. We have other projects in the lab, but uh, I didn't have time to present them today. So I guess you got a good idea of what the, the bioactivity descriptors can be used for and how we can blend them to uh, biology descriptors to get these or to move towards this personalized design of uh, small molecules. Thank you very much. And I'll be most happy to take questions. Thank you, Patrick. That's a, that's a very nice talk with a lot of things. I guess there will be also a number of questions, please. Vicky, you are always the faster one. Please go, ask your question. 
She doesn't have a mic. This is a, you know, this is the supercomputing center. You don't have a mic. She said, very nice about creating new compounds based on the biology descriptor. Will you be able to predict the effect of them? Sorry, I don't have a mic in the camera. I can read again. New compounds based on biology. Would you be able to predict the effect of them? Well, this this is the idea. So it's not it's not to predict only the effect of them. Is that we are creating them uh, precisely based based on the effect that we are predicting, right? So this is so this this uh, this uh, the signaturizers. So trying uh, internally in the in the generative model. This is what we use. So these signaturizers, this predicting the effect is what we use as a loss function, right? So we are we are trying to maximize uh, these activities. So the idea is that yes, on the paper we have tried a numerous of uh, of different scenarios. For the vast majority of them, we cannot get compounds that do what we want them to do, but for for a few cases we can, and these are the ones that we are we are about to test. The questions. About this, in this variational autoencoder that you use to generate new new compounds, are you studying the latent features that you obtain in the middle? Like when you have the encoder, you get through some features and then you have the decoder. Are you exploring these features or studying them? In yes, yes, absolutely. And this is this is what uh, this is what makes the difference in the cases that we think work and the ones that do not work, right? So we have to go look at the latent space, and then when we see a latent space that is continuous, so that we can really move from one to another. Then the experiment is more likely to work. But what we find in the vast majority of the cases is that the, the latent space is very discontinuous, right? Mm -hmm. And then we try to generate so to to decode. Uh, new molecules from this latent space, then what we get is something that we don't think is correct. But yeah, latent space is the key in here. I have to say though that it's very difficult. It has been very difficult for us to use uh, variational autoencoders. We've been fighting with them for three years or so, and then we we completely we have not abandoned them completely, but we are moving to uh, transfer and range form and learning algorithms that mm. seem to be much better. I see. Okay. And are, and are much less expensive. I have to say. David, you were first. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, impressive work. Uh, so you you mentioned now that the synthetically accessible uh, uh, molecule space is huge, no? And one of the the main uh, limitation of generating new molecule most of the time is uh, how actually it's easy then to synthesize those molecules in the lab. Um, so do you think that this is an information that can be taken into account in order to constrain? this search and, and if it's available, like uh, how easily is to chemically synthesize this? No, absolutely. So as, as, uh, as I showed in, the, in my first slide, so the, the best retrosynthesis planning experiment that we have now or, or medicinal chemistry is a neural network, right? And this one is available. So we have not used this information to restrict our models, but as a filter afterwards, right? I see. So we produce the models and then we couple this uh, this uh, prediction of the synthetic accessibility. So this is this is where we use this is what we used to do uh, up to uh, a couple of years ago. But now, as you might have heard, there's this uh, new way of synthesizing molecule that is uh, mainly pioneered or exploited by uh, enamine that is fragment based. So these guys are able to produce billions of different molecules. So basically what we are changing now is instead of predicting the synthetic accessibility at the end to predicting whether it can be created using the, the enamine fragments, but it's the same. So we are not, we're not using this as a constraint in the model. We're using it as a filter afterwards. I see. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, me. Okay. Yes, please, please. At, 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 at much higher level and a general level, um, Imagine I have a pharma company, and uh, what what are you providing? What 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 is the substitution, or what where can you help in the first part of of uh, defining the first compound, or is it more at the end of the refinement because you're proposing new compounds as well? It is it is both. It is both. So uh, in the first part, so the chemical checker at the end. I mean, I can I can paint it in colors and dress it very beautifully. But at the end of the day, what we have is new descriptors for small molecules, right? So our new descriptors that you can use from the very beginning to look for compounds that are similar, etc. So this is fine. 
then generative models. So uh, we are, we are. I mean, what I presented that we're doing is, is a very difficult exercise. So trying to come up with a new chemical compound that does something that no other compound does. Uh, there are intermediate scenarios that we're also exploring, that is trying to guide the uh, diversification or the SARS experiments, right? So you already have your active scaffold, you have your, your your heat molecules and then you want to optimize them to lead so of course there's there's a bunch of modifications that the med chems used to do but they're mainly blindly and then they have to explore it so what we can do now using in this case is not out on colors as i said is using reinforcement and transfer learning is to guide you in the sort of modifications that you have to do to improve the potency or to avoid side effects etc so this is this is uh, uh, of course less exciting because it is a uh, is less innovative, but is a is an easier exercise. Yeah, it saves money. Yes, it saves it saves money and it saves time in in yeah. different in different trials. So we have we have now a project where we're trying to uh, modify antibiotics uh, antibiotic compounds so that they are effective in one species but not in the other. So of course the antibiotic always goes against the the back the the bacterial target but then we can sort of modify them so that uh, they are less effective in plants than in human, for instance, so that we can, we can try to avoid uh, resistance appearance and things like that. And these are, these are small changes. It's not designing new molecule, it's just uh, uh, applying a, a small chemical modifications to known scaffolds. Thank you, very nice. Marta? You're mute, Marta. I cannot hear you. <laughs> I just said fantastic talk. <laughs> um, so I have two questions. The first one is uh, out of the different um, biochemical descriptors that you have or the activity uh, descriptors that you have, which one of them is more important or what does it depend on? I mean, you have transcriptomics, proteomics, all of these different, have you looked at it? And I'm just curious to know. We, we use we use all of them. So I, I played a trick here uh, at some point and it's that, that I, I didn't tell you when I showed you the characterization of the different compound collections, the human metabolites and the bacterial metabolites. So I, I didn't tell you which ones we were using. That's because we use something that we call global signature, right? So these, these are vectors. These are, these are, each descriptor is a 128 dimensional vector that they are orthogonal. So what th this means is that you can stack one after the other. Right. So when we have enough data and we don't know which one is the most important one, what we do is to stack one after the other, and then we end up with descriptors that are uh, three thousand two hundred dimensions. Right. And this is this is always our first approximation. This is something that we call the global signature. Right. And then depending on the exercise, if we smell that the transcription could be more important here, or if we smell that it's gonna be, I mean, something that, that uh, we want to avoid side effects, et cetera, then we handpick, uh, we handpick which ones we wanna use. And of course, uh, we use different methodologies like this Shapley uh, analysis that I'm sure you're familiar with. So we, we train classifiers with the global signature and then we extract information of which ones are the, the, the different vectors or the positions in the vector that provide the most uh, information. And then, but this is, this is the strategy. So when we have enough information, because of course, if you're dealing with more than 3000 dimensions, this means that you're very prone to overfit your models. So you need a lot of information, but when we have enough information, we start from these global signatures and then we reduce them. This is our, this is our approximation. And then my next, oh, this is related to my next question. So what's next? I mean, what, I mean, there is now an explosion of data, like you said. So is there any, I don't know, I can think of, I don't know, like maybe, for example, in transcriptomic single cell data. Now there's going to be a ton of single cell transcriptomic data sets or multi-omic data sets that maybe can be used. But so, I'm sure so this is this so what we what we're doing now is of course incorporating depending so we have the machinery ready so uh, what we are doing is incorporating new bioactivity spaces depending on the on the on the project right so what we are doing now is building more spaces related to antibiotic resistance and to a microbiome so not measuring the effect of compounds into eukaryotic cell but measuring the effect of these compounds onto a microbial or onto the microbiota cells, this is one thing, and then with, with a lot of applications, like what I was telling David, right? So trying to modify antibiotics so that screw up something, but not the other. And then single cell, this is definitely the next step. And uh, there's, there's one, 
master student, hopefully PhD student uh, next week in the lab, uh, Elena Pareja, that I think I've seen her uh, around, that is going to be her project precisely. So how, how to implement single cell, uh, uh, not only transcriptomics, but also proteomics into the, into the signatures. Yeah. Thanks. Can I ask another question? Is, are yes, we, please, please. So Pat, Patrick, in this data augmentation, let me see if I get this because, so, so you have initially 1 million molecules that were compiled or you gather data and now you are, then you use data augmentation to, to recover the empty spaces that with the Siamese networks. But that's, this includes new chemical entities. Can you now, after you recover that, bring new chemical entities, look for similarities and so add more than 1 million compounds in there? So this is we haven't we haven't done that yet, and in fact, this is some of the problems that we're running into. So uh, of course, I mean, we we can train deep networks with uh, with uh, the chemical checker, right? So the, the one million molecules with partial information data augmentation, as you say. So we have complete information for this one million molecule. We use this uh, to train the signaturizers. But of course, we can we cannot dream up uh, bioactivity signatures for compounds that are radically different to anything that we have seen. Right. And sure, sure. I'm, 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 I'm thinking of, you know, keep enlarging slowly, slowly enlarging, enlarging, and just something that's growing based on similarity, obviously. So what what we are doing? I mean, this this is uh, as I said, this is this is what we are exploring now. So it's not it's not growing uh, step by step. It's just uh, our approach is taking these completely uncharacterized compound collections, and then see uh, whether it makes sense. Uh, I mean, how far we can go. From the original compound so that the bioactivity signature still makes sense right so how do we do that because of course the the uh, these deep networks that we are using when they don't have enough information on one particular space what they do is to use the information that they have from the chemistry right so when when we see that the signatures that the bioactivity signatures for a compound do not diverse enough from the ones that we could get from the chemistry, we know that we are not adding anything. And this is, this is what we're exploring now. So we don't know how far we can go yet. And this leads me to, to, to a follow-up question. Uh, when you're doing GANs or variational well, generative models, um, now you're coming out, for example, you want to do reinforcement, uh, reinforcement of, of, of the discriminators probably, you know? And then, and then those are going to be based on features that the chemical checker will provide. And those are going to be only be provided accurately if the molecule is very similar to one that exists and you are creating new molecules. So how, how this um, ties up together? You know, how can you be confident of your new molecule predictor where you are trying to find something different, patentable, etc., if you are based on the scriptos that are based on similarity somehow? So, so this is key. So, what the the only way? I mean, if if you can come up with a better way of benchmarking it, I, I, I'm all ears, basically. <laughs> but basically, what we're doing is we're trying to evaluate how well we're doing uh, using something that doesn't consider our bioactivity signatures at all, right? For instance, we take SAR series for many compounds that are available in the literature. Right, so we know that the optimization, how the optimization of a compound goes. I mean, we have whatever uh, from 200 to 2000 derivative, and we have the, the 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 SAR series there. And then to train and to generate models, we only use bioactivity information, but then we evaluate using the chemistry whether one or some of the compounds that we are generating are correlated with the ones in the SAR series, so that we are not contaminating this. So this is. This is the way we have now to evaluate it, but uh, but again, this is this is key, right? So we want to evaluate uh, the methodologies before going uh, to the lab. So if you can come up with something better, uh, I'll be I'll be all ears. The other thing that we do is for collections of uh, of uh, proteins for which we have a squillion inhibitor. So we're working with uh, matrix metalloproteases, for instance, one to thirteen. Right, so we have we have inhibitors that are specific for each one of the MMPs, and some that are dual. Right, so we start only we train the GAN, or we train in this case is is, is uh, reinvent. We train uh, reinvent with the, the the inhibitors of MMP nine and MMP thirteen, for instance, and then we evaluate whether the things that we are producing are closer to the common inhibitors that we know they exist. So this is this is what we're using using as evaluation. I mean, to, to me here, it, and this is a philosophical debate we can discuss a lot, no? but 
but there is something that that can create this uh, abinitia knowledge, which are the force fields. I mean, the, the, the molecular interactions, they've been there for 20 years and they do not depend on similarity or, or the, let's say that the similarity they demand is minimal, is significantly reduced. And now, you know, there's a war. I've been talking this with, with, with pretty high people at the, at the pharmaceutical company level and, and they are burned out with, from AI a little bit for the last two, three years. And they, they are searching for something, as you said, something that, that does not depend on much on this similarity. And I think that the key solution here is going back to the four seals, not, not, not the way they were used 10 years ago, but to immerse them into this reinforcement. So, so, so data augmentation from the solutions that they will provide, because that can come out of, of the dissimilarity with lots of false positives. We know that with several true, with, with, uh, uh, some, uh, with, with a lot of true positives. Yeah. So we, we, I mean, if, if you're interested, Victor, we're open to uh, collaborating for sure. So uh, we, we don't know enough of, of these four fields. What I know is that the good ones are very expensive and that's something that we cannot create uh, uh, from scratch. If we go to something simple, simpler, like a uh, small molecule docking, things like that, I mean, I just don't trust the results basically. So uh, it's, it's, not, it's not something that I would use to evaluate. If, if we can go to hybrid models or whatever it is that, that, uh, that you're producing, that, that'd, be, that'd be great. And of course, I mean, this is, this is something that people, people are doing, right? So creating, a, uh, so uh, feeding uh, generative models with, uh, with uh, biophysics directly. Exactly, exactly. Not, that, that, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the main one. That, that's for sure. I mean, if, if, if you can evaluate, I mean, if, if you can evaluate some of our uh, uh, generated molecules, that, that'd be great. I mean, that would be an extra level of, of uh, certainty that we would get before going to the lab, yeah. Just, just on, this, on this discussion, that is a very, uh, uh, I guess it's a fundamental discussion. I was reading today the latest paper from DeepMind on predicting a protein function, and they finished with the following two sentences. The um, up, they say that probabilities output by deep models are often overconfident rather than well calibrated. And networks perform poorly on out of distribution data without being aware that they are outside their own range of expertise. So I think this is just exactly, I think it's very, it's, it's very nice that they end up saying, you know, we do all this, but we are aware that. Uh, Predicting things outside the range, so this is actually what you're trying to do, is pretty difficult. And, and the network doesn't really know if it's predicting outside the range or not. And therefore, doesn't really have a good way of calibrating the scores to say if they are predicting outside the range or not. Oh, and, no. and this, this is why the, the, the problem of validation you are discussing. This is, this is key, but this is, this is a, I mean, this is what we call the, the applicability domain, right? So how far uh, you can go. So what we do know is how the networks work and the networks were trying to minimize the error. So whenever, I mean, these, these guys, when, when they don't know what to do, they kind of produce the same junk. That is, is, is something that is not, is not perfectly correct, but is not wrong in all the fronts either. So this is what we call, this is what we call uh, internally the null signature. So whenever we are producing uh, signatures that sort of look uh, extremely the same, we know that it's because the network just doesn't know what to do and we don't trust them. So we, we, we assign them a, a, a low applicability domain score. So, but of course, I mean, you cannot, trust, uh, you cannot trust directly everything that you produce because you always produce something and you have to be critical. Yeah. But then this applicability score becomes really critical, no? Because it's at the end of the day, what you will believe or not in terms of the the results and it's as you say difficult to I mean there is not a well it's not an easy and it's not an easy number to get I will say. David. Yes just one comment about this uh, what about uh, synthetic data generation of the bioactivity descriptors so instead of using the ones that, that you have I mean you use those but to you know create synthetic instances and then you can check how far you can go with, with this. I mean, it's a way of finding the boundaries, basically, of this space that you were describing. So, yes, yes, for sure. We are, as I said, we are, we are still exploring the boundaries. Uh, chemistry is, I mean, I'm biochemist, but more coming from bioinformatics. So uh, uh, chemistry for me is still a pain in the neck, right? 
So very, it very much depends on the, the type of bioactivity. So in some cases, very small changes, I mean, might trigger uh, complete changes in, in the bioactivity, just, mm -hmm. just one in antiomer or the other. And in, in some other cases, you can, you can induce uh, big changes. So this, this very much depends on the type of bioactivity and on the, on the, on the function that you're exploring. But uh, yes, I mean, once, once we have a pinpoint, I mean, in the cases that we know very well, for instance, this that I was telling about the uh, matrix metalloproteases, things like that, that for sure we could go for data augmentation. But we haven't, uh, the problem is, is, is always the same, right? So it's this spacious circle. So we know very well uh, those problems for which we have enough information. So if you have enough information, then you don't need the data augmentation anymore. So it's, it's, uh, it's a bit tricky. Thank you. Uh, if there is any more question, otherwise we go for lunch. There is time for lunch. OK, thank you very much, guys. Well, thanks, Patrick. Very nice and good to have you. Great, great talk, Patrick. Yes.